So thank you very much for the kind introduction. But I'm still going to ask our, um, our distinguished panelists to quickly introduce themselves and the firms that they work for. Sure. Aidan, can you start? Uh, I'm founder and managing director of Felices Ventures. Um, we are a boutique venture capital firm uh, with about 90 active companies, 47 exits, and very excited to also have uh, to be an investor in Rovio and uh, other European companies. And I'm John Malloy. I'm the founder of Blue Run Ventures. We're an early stage uh, fund focused on building global mobile companies. Uh, I'm happy to be back in Helsinki and see so many startups. I actually started at Nokia in the early 90s, so this is a bit of a homecoming for me. So you're actually both on familiar territory because you're an investor in Rovio, so I'm guessing you spent some time here. Um, this is my third slush. This is your third slush. Wow, it's my first. Um, so anyway, the topic of today is what's interesting now from a global investor's perspective. Um, two parts to that topic is the now, so what are the trends? Uh, the other part is global, and we're going to talk about both. Um, to start with uh, the trends, what are some of the, the trends that you see emerging uh, all across the world that you think is interesting from an early stage startup perspective? What do you think startups should be focusing on now? So I'll, I'll take a crack at that first. So um, I think that particularly if you're looking at sort of Western Europe and, and North America, I think you have to start with the understanding that we are at smartphone saturation. So that's good and bad. Uh, the fact that um, we're saturated on the good side is that you have a great addressable market to start gr new services. So Waze would be an example of that. You can, take, you can take advantage of the fact that there's GPS across your entire market. The negative is, is that the market is maturing so that when it's time for you to acquire users, you have to be cognizant of that. You have to understand that the cost for building an audience today is, is, a, is a lot more daunting than it was you know, four years ago for, say, Rovio. Um, I would say when we started investing in mobile about three, four years ago, we were fortunate enough to be an investor uh, in a company called Tapulus that was pre-App Store. And we knew that the first three important segments of mobile was going to be gaming, number one, two, and three. Um, and then uh, social networking. So you can see there are apps like WhatsApp that's doing really well, and news. Uh, for the most part, those three areas have already played. The second wave would be uh, verticals like health and fitness, education. I think there is a lot more to come there. What I'm really excited coming back to the now question uh, is the intersection of mobile and enterprise. Um, I'm going to go on a limb and say mobile is the computing platform. And I think the one area where a lot of people have been focusing is always the consumer angle. But where I see the biggest potential is how do you reimagine the business enterprise side, uh, the productivity apps that we're using today in a mobile world. And I haven't necessarily seen as much innovation there. But that's the area probably I'm most excited and spending the most time. Why do you say that you haven't seen a lot of innovation there yet? What do you think the reasons are? Um, you know, it's interesting. It's not as easy as the consumer apps to tackle. Uh, there's a lot of entrenched players. But I think what makes it hard and challenging also makes it a very attractive target area. Um, I mean, we are seeing, for instance, there are some global players. When you look at areas like invoicing, payments, we're already seeing kind of new names, new brands emerge as the global leaders. Uh, but then when you think of other things that we're using, like email, productivity apps, it's still pretty much stuck in stone ages. And, and, and there hasn't been a lot of innovation because these are mostly monopoly or very strong businesses that haven't really had competitive pressures uh, th that necessarily resulted in a way that we, we use them today on our mobile phones. They weren't really imagined for mobile devices. They were imagined for PCs. Um, I mean, anybody in the audience, uh, how many times do you have to use email from mobile? And you're like, this sucks. I can't have 10 windows in here. I can't do search the way I would do, or productivity apps. They're not just designed for these. And yet, I, I see that as a very important aspect of you know, what could really succeed in the marketplace. I, I think part of the problem is actually the media. So I, th I think that the media, particularly the tech media, focuses too much on entertainment and on sort of the frivolous. And what That's, we're talking it's about is, fault, it's basically. your fault. <laughs> so it's really about changing people's lives. And so productivity is really important. Um, I think solving big problems is where you're going to build great businesses. And I think too often we send the message that you should just 
build a cool, the cool app, and it's really not about the cool app. It's really about hard work and trying to make a difference in the day-to-day -day life of people. So it's utility and productivity. That's the real future for great, great mobile companies. Right. So John, I want to talk a little bit about Blue Run Ventures. You've been sure. around for, what, 15 years now, yes. give or take? Um, you have offices, three offices actually in Asia, yes. two in China, one in South Korea. Um, why don't you have an office in Europe? Uh, you know, my perspective uh, is a mobile one, so it, I don't really care where you start, it's where you want to end up. And uh, it's really about, when we look at sort of markets, it's, uh, we look, there's a lot of factors, we care about them, but ultimately it's where's the exit market. And so I think that when you start a company, you do have to think about exit. And so the reason I'm in those markets is that there, there's actually better exit opportunities in those markets. But many of my successful investments have actually originated in other places. So it's really about starting, getting a foothold, and then taking to the market that's going to define your success. And so I would say the U.S. primarily, but then China secondarily are the, you know, that's why we're in those markets. Right. Aiden, um, your thoughts on that? Because you've invested in quite a few European companies. Yeah, I mean, the way we think about it is, it's funny, uh, maybe this like the European approach. I, I'm originally from, from Turkey and we're present uh, in Europe. I think traditional VC model is, you need to have a local office, and we just have a small office in Palo Alto, yet we've been able to do uh, some pretty high-profile deals in you know, places like Finland, Canada, uh, Brazil, Israel, um, uh, and some other countries in Europe. I mean, the way we think about it is um, our philosophy is backing the iconic companies of today and tomorrow. Uh, we don't really care where those companies are based, um, so we're kind of global. And because our firm is made out of uh, seven people that each come from a different background and country, we feel very natural. And even our companies in Silicon Valley, um, our founders come from 30 different countries. So I think it's very hard to define things in a way where it's like just only one country. So many of them have operations in multiple places. It's just a natural thing for us uh, to work with local investors. But um, we're very excited. We think you know international is a very important area and it, you know mobile has been a very democratizing force also for a company non-US companies to be much more prominent and successful All right so John you, as you mentioned you were an executive at Nokia in the 90s um, you invest in mobile startups with Blue Run Ventures so you've seen this um, the whole mobile industry change over the last 20 years um, what would you say has been the biggest driver for uh, the revolution that we're seeing now in the mobile mobile industry um. Well, actually, and how can startups benefit from it? Well, you know, actually, Yorma touched on it earlier, uh, not to do a commercial for uh, an old Nokia friend, but I will. Um, you know, I really believe in creative destruction. And so uh, I think that's the secret of Silicon Valley, is that the way I look at these big companies is that they're almost like, they're almost like star systems. And when they break up, they unleash a lot of energy. They unleash a lot of really talented people. Um, and I think that that's kind of the, the secret of Silicon Valley is that we're constantly renewing and there's many of those stars. I think here you had, you know, Nokia was clearly a star. It captured second generation mobile. But now that it's actually, you know, broken up to a certain extent, uh, I think that's unleashed a lot of talented people in the marketplace, a lot of investors. And so you need that kind of push, you know. Uh, that coupled with a fantastic educational system, uh, a lot of talented engineers coming up, combined with experienced people, I think that that's, you know, that's a great thing. The last bit that every market needs is a risk culture, and, I, and in Finland that's been a, a challenge sometimes, in that you have to be willing to fail. And it's, you, you have to convince your parents uh, that it's okay to fail if you're a kid. Uh, I remember myself, it, the United States wasn't always like that. So when I started my first company, it was actually in the early 90s, and I lived on the East Coast. And when I told my mom that I was starting a company, there was a pall over the conversation. It was almost as if I died, you know, like she was hoping that I would change uh, <laughs> my decision, but ultimately it proved to be the right decision. I think that shift in thinking that it starts to become okay to start a company has to happen. And the, the beautiful thing about this event is that clearly it's happened for a lot of people. I'm, I'm literally overwhelmed by the number of uh, exciting startups that have happened and a lot of good friends that are sort of out there you know, providing a lot of uh, dollar support, but more importantly, intellectual capacity to really help companies, you know, make a difference. All right. I didn't go into your um, professional background a little bit. Uh, you joined Google very early on. Um, 
last millennium, actually, it was in 99. Yeah. Um, so you were a product manager, you rolled out Google internationally, I think, in 10 countries at the time. Um, and you stayed there until, what, 2005? 2005. And then uh, you started doing some angel investment. When did you feel like angel investment would be your next career move? Or was it always uh, the next step for you? You know, uh, it wasn't really clear. I mean, I was fortunate when I showed up at Google, uh, it was a bunch of uh, awesome engineers and PhDs, uh, and I admired their technical talent, and they looked at me as the guy that spoke multiple languages. So naturally, I was the first international uh, uh, focused person there. Uh, launched Google internationally, and then I was also the first international salesperson. So it was kind of a really fun experience, and you know, you kind of wonder like, how does that translate into angel investing? It turns out that actually, you know, investing business is less about numbers and deals, and more about relating to people. Uh, the best founders have the luxury of being able to work with anybody they like, and I ended up traveling to 40 countries for Google. Um, and, and you know, doing business in places I didn't even understand the language or I've never been. And I think that experience really, really helped uh, me relate to founders uh, in a different way and build a relationship first. And that's kind of what also helped us um, having portfolio companies in nine countries in addition to Palo Alto. Um, it's been really fun because I've seen Google go from 30 people to 3,000 people when I left. Now there are 30,000 people at Google alone, not counting Motorola. Um, I've seen the company go from zero to an IPO, um, from a zero value to like 10, 15 billion dollars during IPO, and now one of the most valuable companies in the world. And honestly, I, I can't really say it's just talent, but it's thinking big. Um, you know, working with Larry Page, one of the most eye-opening things for me is how, how much further he pushed the people in the company beyond their comfort zone. And he had this philosophy like that sometimes I capture in the concept of a rule of 10, which is do things in order of magnitude better, uh, in order of magnitude like 10x, 100x, better, faster, cheaper. Um, and that's the only time when you get meaningful innovation and meaningful results. And that then inspires the best people to come work for you, not just the first few people, but like thinking big helps you then inspire, let's say, like your employee number 27 or 57. Um, th that part of thinking is sometimes uh, I, I, I see can also really help here locally in Europe. All right. Um, so John, you, you invest in companies all over the globe. Um, and I know I travel a lot to meet with entrepreneurs and investors, especially in Europe. And I found that um, when you go to different countries, the culture might be different, the language might be different. But the, the, there are certain traits that an entrepreneur has that are pretty much common everywhere. If you go to the US, you go to Asia, they're common traits. My question is, what are the differences between entrepreneurs that you meet in Europe and Asia compared to the US specifically? Are there any differences? Uh, you, know, the, you know, the great benefit back to my Nokia days when I joined it from a startup was I was really interested in sort of learning about globalization at the time and really starting to understand different cultures. So I think you have to always be sensitive to the differences by culture, but those are generally nuanced. Entrepreneurs are kind of entrepreneurs. So engin engineers, people that are driven to start a business, there's more commonalities than there are differences, but there's social mores that you have to be cognizant of. So, you know, how people communicate in China or Korea versus the United States is a pretty extreme gulf. Uh, but generally, I find that you know, you're usually dealing with the same problems as long as you have a, a, a tuned ear to basic communication differences. Just because you're, someone's not, actually Finland's a good example, just because someone's not talking doesn't mean they're not communicating. Right. Fair enough. Same question? Um, sure. Um, I think one element uh, I would capture, I wouldn't necessarily say, hey, there are major differences uh, between the companies and culture, but if I were to look at the one kind of factor that it uh, encompasses among all of our most successful founders is this concept of being a product visionary, having this very acute sense of the product and not stopping until something is really, really, truly amazing, uh, and taking all the unnecessary things away until you're really left with uh, a truly amazing product. And so um, I think that, that, that sense uh, is pretty global. Uh, and, and I think without really that, no other trade can really help you build that amazing, truly um, long-lasting company. But, right. but that said, I, I think the one uh, nuance is ba based upon geography is your go-to-market. 
um, I think that uh, some countries, there's patterns of going to market that are sort of more well-worn, and then they give them advantages. So the one that comes to mind for me is really the difference between Israel and Finland. I think in, in Israel, the mentality is we're going to prove ourselves here with a prototype, and then we're immediately going to go after the big market. And for many years, it was the United States. Lately, it's actually China secondarily. Here, what I have found over the years, it's a little more nuanced and complicated in that when you talk to an entrepreneur, you have so many choices sitting here. And sometimes it, you, you really need to be thoughtful about not getting yourself too fractured and going to too small a market next. So maybe like your next market shouldn't be Estonia, just as a, a hint. I, I think you should go after, you know, you need to realize that this is a very competitive world, that once you've proven the product, you got to go grab the market, otherwise somebody else will, and you're going to have regrets. And you have to really think about, okay, what, how's our industry moving? Who's addressing this problem? And how do I outflank them as quickly as possible? I'd like to differ on that a little bit. I think the mobile, uh, the mobile space is really democratized distribution. I mean, these days, if you're a really successful company, I mean, there are companies that are really, really well. I mean, clearly, you have the local heroes with Rovio and Supercell, but there are companies like from as far as Lebanon that have done really well on the App Store, and nobody really knows where the founder is from, right? I mean, as long as you have a great product, uh, especially in mobile, uh, it's pretty uh, flattening uh, in terms of geography. But the one thing um, I would say uh, that, that I think is very important to pay attention to, just because you have technical talent and you're very passionate about your company, it doesn't guarantee success, and you really need to pick something that's really critical. I've, I've met amazing founders in Finland and Scandinavia, but the one thing I see sometimes is thinking that much bigger, both in terms of the impact of product, why would it be really critical in people's lives, as well as why that product is so much better. Not 10% better, not 12% better, but like more than 100% better in some aspect. So there is absolutely no shadow of the doubt why that product is going to stand out in the marketplace. So I also wanted to address some of the, the changes that are actually happening in the VC industry itself. Um, as you know, the investment um, scene in the US is undergoing a lot of changes, a lot of challenges right now, which I think are going to ripple through to Europe as well at some point. Uh, you have companies like AngelList obviously shaking up um, the industry, especially from an from a angel seed, seed investment perspective, uh, especially with syndicates. Um, so how does this affect you specifically? Let's start with John. Um, well, I actually think we're probably in the same category. I very much view us as an upstart. Uh, you know, so I started the firm. I think we'll always, I will always think like, like the founders, or I will always be the founder of the firm. And so I don't really view myself as part of the club. And so I like new changes in the ecosystem. So on the venture side, I think that I'm always looking for more people to work with. Aiden and I have co-invested a couple of times. Uh, I, you know, new entrants, if you don't embrace new entrants, then you're out of business. Uh, so I definitely don't take the view of an incumbent. I think change is good. Obviously, uh, it can be wrenching. There needs to be some thought, you know, there needs to be, uh, uh, there will be mistakes made and there maybe needs to be uh, some learnings from the market in terms of having, you know, not having people with the wrong profile, risk profile, put too much money into early stage companies. I think that some people will lose money and that's unfortunate. Uh, but generally, I think that democratization of capital is a good thing. So two, two more perspectives to add here. Um, one perspective is I think the best way to handle change is to embrace it. So not only have we done deals in AngelList, but we also have a company in our portfolio called Funders Club uh, that is kind of innovating in this space. So I think we just kind of launch into it head on. Um, and then you have aspects of the ecosystem that has changed. For instance, because of Kickstarter, we're seeing so many more companies now that have a hardware element. Um, some of our biggest actually successes came from software companies that use hardware as a Trojan horse. By the way, you know, just to kind of map it to another point, I also think that's one of the really interesting future areas. Um, the, and then the, the next thing um, I want to say, on the one hand, there is all this great innovation and funding. On the other hand, I feel uh, this is one of these businesses where you know, some things don't scale, and it's pretty much a relationship business. I mean, we are in companies where literally 
there might have been a lot of great VCs locally. I mean, there was a lot of investors in Finland, yet we've been able to fit into the syndicate of Rovio. Uh, in the case of, you know, like Waze, for instance, you guys were, you know, investor in an Israeli company. I, I think it's still a very much one-to-one -one relationship business. So regardless of how many funds there are, how many crowdfunding innovations, at the very end, uh, this is still very much built on real human relations. And that is not something that automatically scales with technology, but what technology provides you is more options, more of an equalizing factor, more of a kind of easier way to compare companies, more like an apples to apples. Um, a lot of companies that might not be super hot or hyped in the press, it gives you a chance to get more access to uh, a broader uh, range of investors. So I think in that sense, it's really great and hopefully should contribute to innovation. The, the, the one thing, I think the one thing for startups to remember is that every move sets up your next move. So when you're raising that capital, you need to think about what are the needs of, the, of, of, that partic of your particular business and who are we going to need to track along the way. And so you have to actually be pretty forward thinking. Like, I don't just raise money for the sake of money. Just because money's easy, that's, that's actually, don't necessarily take it. Think about, you know, what you're going to need to actually grow the business. So you have to have a long-term view very, very early in the process. That makes sense. Um, so we're out of time. Just really quickly, if a startup manages to grab you um, after your talk and he does a two-minute pitch, what's the one thing that he has to give you for you to be interested in the first place? You know, I think really it's very hard to kind of focus like uh, a lot of uh, attention in a brief meeting here in the audience. But I think if there is something that could be like kind of a cliffhanger where like, you know, uh, either of us would be much more interested in finding more about the company, doesn't have to be a full pitch, but like one interesting aspect about the team or company that really warrants more attention and why it's really different and unique. Um, that would be awesome and look forward to running into you guys after the, after the session. So um, two yeah. words, big problem. You have to convince me that you're really trying to solve a big problem. Uh, I, that's, that's what's an, always, uh, that gets me addicted to the mission. Uh, it makes me, tells me that you're actually thinking about really a true disruption and that makes it worth the time invested, which is even more important than the capital. All right, on that note, gentlemen, thank you very much. Round of applause for our panelists.